Do you want to take revenge on those very annoying neighbors that keep renovating their apartment for the whole year, making you hear that very annoying buzzing sound to the point where you just want to beat some people in chess? I think the Italian game is the perfect opening to achieve this task. You can uh, use the anger and uh, throw it at your opponents by specifically playing the evergreen D3 variation. So in the first game, I'm going to be showing you the uh, revolutionary approach uh, used by Magnus Carlsen, which is to actually delay uh, short castle by playing knight f1, knight to g3. And in the second game, I'm going to be showing you an alternative, a way more aggressive way of playing the Italian game. And of course, I couldn't really uh, leave you hanging in case your opponent uh, plays one of the most annoying openings ever created, the pet of defense. So at the end of the video, I also prepared a very spicy, interesting idea that uh, you can use. So without any further introduction, let's annoy some opponents. All right, everybody, getting a white game and open it up with e4. And hopefully we're going to be getting an opponent that allows us to play the Gioco Piano. So there we probably have it. Knight to c6, no Petrov, no nonsense. Just getting the um, standard position on the board and uh, now black has a variety of move orders he decides to start with knight of six which uh, <laughs> may allow one of your favorite moves which is knight to g5 uh, the um, little fried liver however if you're looking to build up a solid foundation i would highly recommend you stay away from uh, let's say, potential nonsense, uh, dreaming of uh, quick free wins. Because after d5, the lines are very complicated and not very intuitive uh, if black knows what he is doing. So I recommend you instead play d3. Simple move, defending the pawn, preparing to castle. And uh, what is even more important, it is keeping the game in very standard territory for the Italian in general. Okay, like, I want you to pause for a second and... Uh, Think about this. Sure, sometimes they allow the fried liver. But what are you gonna do when they start with the bishop just playing the Italian? You cannot really like prepare yourself hoping that they're gonna make knight of six or they're gonna play bishop to c5. And it is just a little bit of a waste uh, to have uh, to learn, let's say, new variation if they play knight of six and uh, new variation on bishop c5. So. I recommend you stick with d3 against both and generally you'll just have a way a uh, little more, uh, let's say, uh, less to know and uh, you can focus on actually learning the possessions. So we do get the Italian transposition and uh, I'm going to start with castle. Definitely many ways to play this. I would say generally castling is the most common. Additionally, a different plan could be c3 bishop b3 and if you're trying to delay castle there is this idea knight d1 uh, i mean knight d2 knight f1 uh, knight to g3 which has uh, actually been played uh, by magnus Carls. which you know what i think i'm gonna actually play this time i want to show you uh and perhaps give you a little bit of a historical uh, introduction of this variation because i believe uh, magnus used this setup um, if I can recall correctly, to defeat uh, David Howell, perhaps, in the London Classic, somewhere around, like, maybe 2013. I remember I was just a kid, and after I saw that game, I think I went ahead and I played it uh, the other day uh, in my tournament, and it gave me a pretty nice win. Just to make a small clarification there, I did check and my memory was wrong. I was actually referring to the game between uh, Magnus Carlsen and uh, Hikaru Nakamura, from the London Classic and uh, the year was 2011. So for those of you that are curious, you're going to be able to find uh, the link to the game uh, in the description. Now, back into the video. So the point is to play knight d2. I don't think we need to be afraid uh, of stuff like knight g4 so that uh, we play h3. We could, but I don't think it's like really required. So I'm just going to go knight d2. And I'm going to assume my opponent plays simple with d6. Like, sure, they could do d5, which is leading to uh, different positions. Hopefully, he's going to keep it simple. 
if D5 uh, will have to take. You know what? On D5, even though it is best to take, you could still uh, try to uh, make this work by going Queen E2, which I'm going to play uh, in this game. Okay, we have D5. I'm going to go Queen E2. The idea is that uh, I'm going to take back with a pawn. The pawn structure is a little bit symmetrical, but I'm keeping uh, the same plan to go knight f1, and then to go, uh, oops, all the way to g3. Uh, and we're trying to sort of save uh, a tempo. Because if you had to do this, like the normal way, notice that you have to go castle, then you have to play rook e1, and then you have to go knight f1, knight g3. So we're trying to save that rook e1 tempo, basically. That is pretty much uh, all that there is going. I know. A tempo may uh, not seem like much at the beginning when you're just getting started, but uh, it could just be a huge difference uh, between having a nice advantage and the position being completely equal. So, putting goes bishop to e6, just very fine developing moves so far by uh, my opponent. Uh, I think I'm going to stick with knight f1. The only thing that uh, I need to calculate first is whether d, d, bishop b3, a, b3 could be interesting for my opponent. I don't really think so. Uh, I think our position is pretty safe there. Additionally, knight g5 is always something that you want to uh, double check whenever uh, you can, harassing that bishop. But because of bishop g4, uh, that's a little bit annoying. I don't think uh, we can benefit from that. Okay, knight f1. The only kind of uh, annoying move would be for him to play knight a5, now that I'm looking at it. Knight a5, problem with it is that it's dropping the e5 pawn, so I think we should be okay in that line. The main thing that uh, kind of scared me a little bit was that after bishop c2, uh, d, e, d, e, uh, there is this uh, c4 square vulnerable, like bishop c4 becomes a move that, you know, could be a little bit annoying. But yeah, I don't think that's a problem, so I'm just gonna go knight f1. Sometimes you can also just drop your bishop there to kind of overprotect stuff, but... I think uh, it's kind of to our advantage if he uh, goes in for the double trade, uh, opening up the rook. So I'm going to still give him that option and uh, just preparing knight to g3. In case of knight g4, uh, we will have to play the move knight e3, by the way. Uh, that is pretty important. You have to know this because otherwise there's no convenient way in defending f2. But basically after we play knight e3, uh, knight takes, bishop takes bishop takes queen takes uh, okay he goes for the trading variation expecting him to take uh, otherwise um, it's not clear why would you uh, make this exchange so we'll probably have that on the board but uh, still black uh, has the option of going knight g4 which is going to be parried by knight e3 it's going to take us to a very interesting, uh, equal-looking position where I feel like white has very good uh, potential for a squeeze in the long term in case of knight g4. If he doesn't play knight g4, I think it's even better for us uh, with like the more pieces on the board. But uh, yeah, there he goes. Quite principal play by my opponent. I have to say for his rating, he has played a lot of logical moves, sticking with a lot of... Uh, let's say, basic opening principles, like developing your pieces, breaking in the center, trading. Um, you know, normally when you are playing uh, with the black pieces, trades are quite welcome. Uh, kind of uh, getting rid of, uh, let's say, white's attacking potential. But my opponent probably is not expecting uh, the upcoming Jokopiana squeeze. Because sure... If you look at it with a, uh, with the engine, I guess the position is around equal. But uh, just by the way uh, the pawn structure is designed, um, I think white is the only side that can play this for a win. And uh, therefore we have the easier game. I'll explain uh, why after, let's say, the next uh, two moves. I'll wait for him to take. I don't really think uh, there's like any other logical move to be honest so the fact that he's taking over a minute in this position it's kind of suspicious it's not like you would ever play h5 or anything else or you'd go back with a knight so 
He has to trade. Okay, he does not. He just plays queen to d7, which uh, looks a bit weird. Not in a way that it's a good move. So nothing scary there. But yeah, I'm just going to play h3. I'm going to just uh, clarify the situation. I want him to take so that um, we're getting the typical structure. He did not take. Uh, okay. All right. I think this is going to get pretty instructive, but I really wished uh, he would have uh, taken and we would have uh, gotten that position where white is slightly better. I'm going to show you uh, some typical ideas to use there because this is a very common position for the uh, Italian. But for now, uh, let's try to make the best uh, out of... Uh, the position that we have. So there's many ways of playing this. Okay, obviously there is simple play castle. I mean, there's like a hanging pawn. <laughs> so we'll probably have to defend that first. But let's say you get castle. But what is even uh, yeah, more interesting, I think we could play this knight f5 type of move. And already it feels like uh, my opponent has to live with a sword hanging on top of his head with such a knight on f5. Um, because just imagine it's immediately staring into g7. We can never really play g6 because that would weaken a lot of dark squares. And uh, bishop g5 would be a simple way to continue. Kind of forcing bishop b7. Breaking that pin. I could also play b4. You know what? b4 is going to be a very tricky move. Although b4, does he have 94 ideas? Because on queen e4, there's going to be queen d1 checkmate. That is also something we need to kind of watch out for. I can castle. I was just a little bit hesitant about castling because maybe in the future we could have g4 ideas to uh, make some use of the pawns as well. But I guess knight e4 is a, big, uh, is a bit of a huge threat. So yeah, just because of that, we may have to play without it. Although like b4, knight e4, if we calculate a little bit, bc5, queen f5, can he defend the piece after knight h4? I don't think he can. Like notice the queen has to leave and uh, the knight will be uh, undefended. Yeah, I think, that's a, I think that's a fair line. So we're just going to go b4. Now, the trick with b4 is that if I'm able to, uh, let's say, force... Something like um, bishop a7, then bishop g5 will be way more annoying. Because if we would have had to start with it right away, he had bishop e7, kind of a simple move. When he commits the bishop to this diagonal, I feel like the bishop is simply kind of caught uh, off guard. It's just a little bit offside. So uh, I think just in general, in these type of positions, imagine typical maneuver for black is rook eight, bishop f8, to kind of keep the bishop defending the king. When you manage to get it off that diagonal, you get a lot more freedom um, to attack. So now he's going to be forced to play queen e6, defending. How are we going to answer that? Hmm, just place queen e3, forcing the queen trade. But in the same time, he's forcing um, a worse endgame. So I'm just going to be taking and with such a monster knight on f5 that he's never going to be able to uh, get rid of. This is still just a dream possession. Okay, like sure, he's going to be able to get rid of one knight. But we exchange and then the other knight is landing on f5. So this is very exciting. Now. We could think of rook d1 trying to play for open file, but that gives him trade and then rook d8. And I don't want to be trading both rooks. So I could trade one rook, but I'm thinking maybe there is a way to make this idea work and just kind of still play uh, for the weakness of his king, despite uh, this being an endgame. So I'm going to go g4. I'm going uh, for the throat, basically. Yeah, he plays rook e8, he's preparing knight e7, sure. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, can I start with g5, fg, and then rook g1? Because on like f6, there is h4, and we kind of managed to open up the position, and just notice the bishop is never able to return. He could do rook g1, sure, like not rushing, like knight e7, and then takes, takes, bring the other knight, knight h4, knight f5. 
Hmm. I feel like uh, G5 right away is kind of hitting him like a train in full speed. So I would just like to start with that. Maybe it's just me getting a little bit of excited with the uh, position. But this just looks very juicy. Like FG, I'm going to use this rook. You know what? Potentially it could be interesting to use the other rook. Like rook hg1, because after f6, h4, I'm going to be taking kind of both rooks I'm going to be a sort of. So I think that was an important detail. And he just plays the move 97, which I'm not 100% sure of. Like his point is that after knight g6, the knight lands on f4. But maybe I can take first. I'm thinking that uh, to be the best move. And then mm, gf6. Hmm. I don't have a lot of time to calculate this. I'm going to have to uh, take once and then uh, kind of want to play this. He's going to be able to win the pawn, but just because my knight is able to uh, land on f5, uh, it's going to be a big trouble for him. So I'm going to get the knight to f5. In case of uh, rook there, I think we should be able to play at least rook d1. Maybe we don't even need that move. Uh, so yeah, knight lands on f5. I'm going to have to speed up, but just imagine we double up rooks on the g file. His king is on f8. That is almost a mating net. It would be ideal to have the pawn all the way to h5, so we stop the rook from defending. But what is so nice um, and kind of dramatic for my opponent is that... Um, okay, I'm going to start with that to stop rook g6 ideas. His bishop is placed on a dark square, okay? See? Well, my knight is placed on the opposite color. Meaning that he will never be able to take down my knight unless he sacrifices the rook, which is going to be a pretty uh, big price to pay. So I play rook g6 now, I'm going to go h5. And uh, my argument is that uh, his rook is not going to be able to uh, yeah, hang on uh, to the file for a while. Okay, now we have to trade defending against this threat uh, with a pin. But still, just the fact that we have managed to get rid of this solid structure uh, pretty much uh, will allow us to break through, it feels. It's just a pity that we don't have a whole lot of time on the clock, but uh, this is definitely looking very juicy. We're about to penetrate the king h8 rook g7, uh, about to make uh, some dramatic progress. King h8 also knight h6 rook f8. I'm not sure how to make uh, progress from there. But I just kind of want to play that to sort of emphasize on the fact that uh, we may be able to win just by bringing the king. Maybe objectively, rook g7 was a bit of a stronger move, but I don't have a uh, whole lot of time on the clock. So I kind of wanted to play uh, the faster move. So I'm going to go king f3 and the idea is to do that. Uh, okay. Bishop d8 makes sense. I'm going to go king g4. And then king f5. Stopping bishop g5. Maybe bishop f6 now is the point for him. I'm going to do king f5. Oh boy, this is getting very close. Yeah, I'm going to have to keep the knight. Idea to push h6 and trap the bishop next. Come on, let me do it. Hopefully he doesn't play uh, rook g8. Oh. Play the better move. I'm going to have to maneuver. Can I maneuver myself? Knight c4 to d6. Let me play that. Yes. Still probably not going to be in time. Which is sad. But... Uh, <laughs> Just the beautiful squeeze that we're able to get in his camp, play king e6, knight f5. Oh man, this just looks so juicy. Kind of a disaster that we're not able to uh, put the cherry on top of the king, but I'm going to still try. Will be almost impossible to end this with pre-moves only. Knight f5. Rook g6 to come. Next. He 
It cannot check me. Important detail. Bishop AJ through G6 wins the H pawn, which is nice. Bishop F8, King F7 is uh, wow. Look at this. Oh my god. This is just insane. Wait, what if Rook back? What? What if Rook back? Oh, no. He's gonna get made in time. He's gonna get made in time. Oh my god, this is one of the best uh, <laughs> positional squeezes that I have ever played. This just ends up being so juicy. Oh man. Has no way to stop it. G7, the queen. The king is uh, caught in the box. I think this one is gonna go home. Unless I have uh, to promote to a queen. Which is not on uh, auto promote yet. We could have got knight h6, knight f7 with a mate too, but seems we got the uh, auto queen on. Whew, that was. Uh, <laughs> that gave me a scare. It would have been uh, unfortunate uh, not to like get the squeeze, but really? First of all, this was pretty much what won us the game. I think we can check it with a computer. I just think it's such an insanely strong idea. It's kind of only like a fifth move, but I think it's just such an important concept to stop rook g6, because if you, let's say, try to get close, you have no way to make progress without that move. Quick pause to give a shout out to today's sponsor, which is me. I am making this video possible, so in case you want to check out any of my courses, both the London System and Karokan are now on a holiday sale for the next 10 days. So in case you've been waiting to check them out, you can now buy them on a sale with a 40% discount onto the videos. Now, back into the action. Alright everybody, getting another white game. Let's try to get uh, another lovely Italian. Can we do that? Is that too much to ask for? Okay, opponent plays right into it. And uh, this time, we're gonna be going for the Jabal variation. So the plan is, you know, go c3, b4. Literally hunting the bishop just like we normally do in the Jabava London. Um, if it's your first time on the channel and you have no idea what the heck am I talking about, you're definitely missing out. But uh, before you get too excited uh, with the bishop hunt, you want to remember to uh, defend the pawn. Because if you just push, he can take and uh, a5, bishop f2 or knight f2, that's no good. Kind of play d3. And pretty much I think we can divide this uh, in uh, two main uh, set of positions. Let's say I'm going to cancel now and uh, then I'm going to play for a4. And even though technically you could play b5 and try to perhaps steal the pawn, generally it's not that good. Maybe here it works because he's doing weird h6 move, but I kind of want to show you the typical uh, squeeze after a4. So uh, he plays a6, okay? This is the a6 kind of game. He could also do uh, a5, but on a5 uh, the point is to do, uh, uh, to do b5. And... Um, when they're playing with uh, a6, pretty much uh, what uh, you want to do, you want to take uh, even more space. So I'm going to play uh, a5. And after that, I think we have uh, two main ways of playing this. I could do h3, first of all, as a matter of fact, or start with rook e1. But... A pretty cunning idea that I think perhaps we can use is bishop e3 and then try to do a little rook lift if he takes. So I think I'm gonna do that here, but just to sort of always avoid knight g4, maybe attacking our pawn, I wanna do it this way. And uh, okay, my opponent plays d6 with the idea maybe bishop e6. Normally, what I noticed in this structure, it is just amazing to sort of double up his pawns. It's not like winning just by that, but it's usually uh, what the computer likes, so uh, I'm gonna tell you that, okay? Play like the computer. Good luck with that. <laughs> For now, I'm just gonna go bishop e3, just because I don't really have any other squares. Um, and normally they would take. If they don't take, that's fine too. Okay, I'm just gonna play knight bt2. And... Um, 
Okay, Bishop E6, I mean, I told you uh, it is uh, good to take. And uh, then I'm going to play Knight B to D2. It's going to become more of like a positional game. I think uh, the main trick will be to go Queen B3 followed by B5 break. Just uh, making progress onto the Queen side. So Queen B3 is nice targeting the pawn, but also preparing B5. I'm still kind of giving him the option to take and uh, open up the rook. I think that's pretty nice for us. And normally for them it's tempting to play d5. But whenever that happens, it's more of a weakening other than making progress. And uh, you see that uh, already his position wasn't very easy to play. And b6 is an uh, atrocious move, okay? Simply horrific positional mistake because I could do a, b. And uh, now my rook has opened up. There is a clear target. He has to take with a bishop, but... Just notice, kind of uh, out of nowhere, I meant to say nowhere, <laughs> it's raining with isolated pawns. So the only thing that we need to do is double up our rooks on the a5, like let's say rook a2, rook a1, and literally scoop up that pawn, you win the game because of that. So um, that should be pretty easy. So there's still ways of doing this. I could also play knight c4 with the idea to optimize the activity of my pieces and uh, put pressure on his uh, pawn. Because if I play rook a2, rook d2, it kind of feels like I'm going to the battle without having the whole army involved, you know? Uh, so I kind of want to activate this knight first just because it's such a simple and convenient move to make. And I'm putting tremendous pressure on the bishop. He can never push d5 because that um, leaves the d5 pawn undefended. And after bishop takes, I have a very pleasant choice between taking with a knight or with a pawn. But uh, as I already explained, I think it makes far more sense to take with a pawn because the knight is already uh, super active. And I totally meant to make it a green knight. So green knights are pretty good. Now, my opponent does uh, exactly what I told you he is not supposed to do and pushes d5. Here I could immediately take. But the question is... Should we throw in ED as well? And what are the chances he takes back with a queen? That is also interesting. I think just something like knight e5, knight e5, uh, and then after queen d6, we could play knight g6. If the rook moves, because it's attacked, we have e5 forking, which is pretty hilarious. And uh, I think we can just get away with that. No need to calculate furthermore. If queen d6 or something, we can do the same. So queen attacks knight, v attack rook, and then rook moves, v push pawn, v win. Pretty simple. So he could try to maybe complicate it somehow by giving up the exchange, but uh, yeah, I don't really see this happening. Like there is queen b6 trying to get a little bit of counterplay, like one check. But what's funny about such positions, they are usually so completely winning that you can even get away uh, with a move such as, let's say, queen b6, d4, like not even taking the knight. <laughs> you know, like d4 saying we got extra pawn, we give him no counterplay. Of course, though, uh, we calculate that we can just do king h1 and he has no other threats. It's like the queen alone is pretty uh, pointless. I mean, not pointless, but not really doing much, so... I'm just going to sidestep. I'm not going to h2 because perhaps there could be some checks via this diagonal. It's not like devastating, but it's kind of like a nice uh, safety measure uh, to have. And uh, third pawn takes. Just going to pick up that pawn. I see no reason why not to. And uh, next step is to bring uh, the last piece into the game. We could also bring the queen, but uh, I don't see a convenient way to do so. Therefore, I'm going to start with the rook. And d4 is bad because it allows queen e6. Like d4 could be an idea to attack this pawn, but it was allowing the other thing. And uh, check comes to mind. He can take the knight though. Uh, and then we have to like calculate a little bit. Usually you don't want to calculate much in such positions. Uh, and with that, I mean, uh, you don't want to sacrifice when you don't have to. So I'm just going to play queen b2, sort of keeping an eye on the diagonal and preparing to bring the queen over. Once the queen comes over, uh, it is going to be game over, you know. Wife is at home, 
fun is over. Somebody had to say it. I'm kidding. If you got the, <laughs> the good stuff. Uh, if not, sorry for you, man. I guess uh, hopefully this video helps. <laughs> I can go maybe 95 or uh, maybe Queen F2. To be honest, what is Rook G8 even implying to do? It's not like <laughs> it's doing anything. It's more of like a confusing kind of move. Uh, uh, this is the kind of position you play rook g8 and your opponent can lose on time just because uh, he's trying to understand what the idea behind your move is. <laughs> when in fact you have no idea about uh, why you play rook g8. So I'm just going to do queen f2 and preparing to do this check. Now he takes my pawn. I can take this. I can also try to calculate. You know me, I'm pretty lazy so I'll try uh, not to go super deep on the line. While I secretly calculate this and I'm not telling you. And now there is a threat of queen f7. When the queen infiltrate, that's game over. I think. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> uh, I don't really see a way for him to stop it because the knight just uh, literally blocks uh, the any squares from the enemy rook. And uh, man, that's a pretty effortless, inconvenient win after getting that. Uh, um, yeah, space advantage. Now we just get to put the mate on the board and uh, it can just be this simple. You play the Jabava Pawn Storm and, uh, well, you just need to go for bishop e3. And it would have been like really nice if he would have uh, been able to show something like this. Uh, assuming, uh, I don't know, he plays uh, bishop e6 or something. I mean, take uh, like knight e2. Or... The point that I'm trying to make, <laughs> rook a2, rook f2, could be such a nice maneuver in these structures. And then uh, you can start uh, launching a kingside attack. Uh, didn't get to happen in this game. We only had to use our, uh, let's say, queenside pressure because he never took. And of course, it really helped that he made this horrific move, b6. Okay, this is the kind of um, unforced error that... Uh, these players are making and that is why it is so easy to climb all the way up to like 2000 just because you can just make a living by exploiting this kind of unforced errors. Uh, if he had to play a better move, say queen d7, I would have really uh, thought about something like queen b3, idea to play b5, uh, the b7 pawn is a target, uh, sometimes uh, you can even consider c4, c5 as a way to... Um, yeah, let's say uh, put pressure in the structure, sort of undermine uh, this pawn, maybe make e5 uh, a bit weaker. Uh, but yeah, b5 and um, yeah, knight c4 activates, a6 um, eventually happens. Just imagine uh, he makes sort of no moves, yeah, like he plays uh, whatever. At some point, uh, well, <laughs> there is always this idea to make a p uh, to win a piece. So let's say uh, we go. Rook fb1, something. Let's just say he makes uh, no moves, yeah, and he plays something defensive. Already, there's always idea to play a6. The knight needs to be well defended, and um, point is he can easily lose. I'm not sure this analysis really proves it, but I wanted to give you an idea how <laughs> you should try to uh, arrange your pieces. So, um, yeah, definitely critical mistake was him pushing d5, but uh, even if he was not pushing d5, Notice how I can easily maneuver uh, one of the rooks towards the isolated pawn and probably just win it. So uh, I think uh, with that being said, we can pretty much move on to the uh, different version of playing the Italian opening. So I'll see you there. Now, before we dive into the final games, I wanted to give you a little bit of context on uh, my idea against the Petrov, which is to... Try and play the reverse Stafford Gambit. In case you don't know what the Stafford Gambit is, it is a variation uh, that goes for the black pieces. It has been uh, popularized by uh, Eric Rosen. And uh, the point is to sacrifice a pawn and uh, not play the normal Petrov, d6 and then take, but to play the risky knight c6. With the idea that uh, if white is not careful, uh, they can immediately get in trouble uh, with a lot of spicy ideas connected with knight g4. So, in fact, we're going to try to do something similar with the white pieces. Because against the Petrov, we can try to go 
bishop to c4, and after knight e4, we can play knight to c3. With the idea that uh, if they take, we just have a uh, Stafford Gambit with an extra tempo, where if black, uh, you know, plays a simple move like d6, they can immediately lose due to knight g5. So, um, in the next game, you're gonna see uh, this kind of accepted variation. And in the last game of the video, I'm gonna show you uh, how to deal uh, with, let's say, the hardest counter that black can play, which is to decline the gambit by playing knight f6 and then uh, by uh, trying to block our bishop with a move d5. So, I think that's enough, and we can just go. Back with the games. Right, all right, all right. Boys and gals, getting another game. Gonna open it up with e4. And okay, getting e5, meaning there's a chance we might be able to play the Italian. However, my opponent seems to be very thirsty. And they want to be getting uh, into that, uh, you know, staff for Gambit. Or the Petrov. However, uh, let me assume that they want uh, the staff one more. Little do they know that I'm going to be playing knight c3 and if black takes by magic sort of we're going to be getting an uh, improved version of the Stafford with colors reverse just because we got an extra tempo however black can still uh, go back with the knight and the game becomes a little bit dull let's say I have nothing better than taking the pawn on e5 but okay opponent decides to bite and uh, we're gonna get uh, an interesting fight. There's 95 as a threat, therefore a lot of people tend to lose by playing d6 defending. Okay, that's very common trap, d6, knight g5. Black's immediately toasted. Uh, so, from uh, my understanding, f6 is the best move. Still leading to kind of interesting positions. Um, but okay. We do have uh, e4, and I'm asking myself, why cannot we just play the same knight g5 and uh, get a little bit of a double attack? Only way to possibly defend against this being to play d5. But then we have bishop takes. And bishop e6 seems to be required. However, I think we got knight takes, pawn takes, and then bishop takes on b7. Which is pretty much trapping the enemy rook in jail. Huh, that's a little bit of a funny variation. I'm not sure my opponent can really do much to avoid this. I mean, maybe there could be interesting to move the queen out uh, to like, okay, allow me to take on f7, but at least it's not a fork. Still, that just looks horrific. So we have d5 on the board. I'm just going to be taking, keeping the same flats. Okay. Bishop e6, like I predicted. We're going to be going knight x on e6, pawn takes on e6, pretty much the only move. But now we can just go for this simple transition and indeed, the rook is placed in home arrest right now. Um, no way to actually escape, uh, more than happy if he trade, uh, trades queens because we're going to get the end game with an extra rook. So technically best for my opponent is knight d7, keeping queens on the board and uh, at least he gets the bishop for the rook. However, his position is still completely losing. Let's see if uh, that is going to happen on the board. My opponent could also very well just rage quit because, you know, like move 9, such a devastating position to have on the board. Uh, it is pretty funny, especially considering that you want to play the Stafford Gambit yourself. And you kind of <laughs> uh, find yourself on the receiving end with colors reversed. That's a bit uh, weird. I mean... Pretty sure my opponent did not realize that we were doing Stafford reversed. But uh, it goes to show the potential of this opening. And uh, hey, if you're looking to uh, get an interesting weapon against the Petrov, because kind of no matter what you play against the Petrov, it's very hard to get an objective advantage. This idea can be uh, leading to quite uh, interesting games. Sure, it is like a little bit risky. But considering that, uh, okay, if our opponent enters the uh, lines where they accept the pawn sacrifice, you just notice how many deadly traps uh, this is filled with. And uh, 
yeah, we just have the extra rook. I'm just gonna proceed by uh, exchanging pieces, offering a trade. Then I'm gonna like move my king up, bring rooks onto the open files. Hopefully we'll be able to rescue the bishop. But even if the bishop gets trapped, we still got the extra exchange. So uh, we don't really care that much about the bishop. Like sure, ideally, you know, we'd like to keep it. But, you know, you don't want to, like, uh, over-obsess over whether the bishop is going to make it uh, or not. So, after that move, surely the bishop can come home. But I'm going to start uh, with this offering uh, trades. Okay, we just have to keep uh, exchanging pieces to make the conversion uh, even easier. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be evil. So, the knight can develop like this. And for that, I'm going to play rook d6, <laughs> cutting away any squares of the knight. And I'm going to give a little check, bringing the bishop home. And okay, you guys can probably already feel that it smells of a back anchor, but okay, I'm just going to infiltrate, placing rooks on the seventh is usually the optimal position for your rooks. So. We'll start by doing that, I guess. And now, you just, you know, we're fishing for knights. <laughs> uh, I mean, fishing for fish is boring, okay? Why would you do that when you can just uh, pick up such a, you know, big horse? I mean, that would take a pretty massive fishing stick. But eventually we get the job done. Thus, forcing resignation. And uh, before I let you go, you really want to remember this trap because it's going to happen most often in your games when they are playing d6. You want to go knight g5 and after bishop e6, take stakes. You don't want to be going for the obvious capture, but instead play queen f3. Threatening check queen f7 while also just creating a ginormous threat of queen takes on b7. And uh, yeah, white is pretty much completely winning. That is why uh, the best play for black is sort of just knight f6 back and then you can like take the pawn and then... We have a choice, uh, let's say, where you want to place the bishop with, um, say, a balanced game. But when they enter the gambit, it just leads to such uh, fascinating games. It's just a pity not to give it a try. So, uh, yeah, with that being said, I think we can just move on to the following game. All right, everybody, getting another white game. I'm going to open it up uh, with e4, and we don't get an e5 game. And the Petrov! Huh. Let's try out uh, our little either Italian transposition or perhaps uh, we're going to get them in the reversed uh, Stafford without them even realizing it. So, uh, yeah, knight c3. If he takes, we genuinely have a Stafford gambit uh, with an extra tempo. It's kind of ironic that, uh, objectively speaking, it's still a little dubious, but it's a little bit better. Uh, compared to like the normal Stafford and more important it is very tricky meaning that your opponent can uh, immediately uh, get in trouble okay knight f6 is essentially saying that I can just take back this pawn but he will play d5 then we get a little bit of a flat game that is kind of what is going on right now I'm going to play bishop to d3 in this position. It's not the standard square, but if you go to b3, c6, and then because of this block of pawns, our bishop is, uh, you know, a little bit uh, restricted, a little bit ismed out on b3. So uh, I'm just going to keep it here. And the point is that later on, I'll try to do this structure. Like, hopefully it's going to work out and I'm going to get a nice attack against his king. Uh, okay, this move is probably gonna come soon, so I want to have a rookie one to support the knight. Uh, there we go. On knight d7, probably I'll have to exchange, cannot really do much about it. But on c6, yeah, I'm just gonna keep following uh, my idea. And okay, sure, of course, objectively speaking, this is probably uh, nothing. Okay, I cannot really support the knight, so I'm going to go back. But it leads to interesting positions, just because, uh, you know, got the double bishops uh, lined up down that uh, diagonal. Uh, okay, he's attacking this pawn, so I'm just going to push it one square. 
he has to go back giving up the bishop pair is um, an yeah, unforced mistake and uh, it's gonna be a question on how to play on bishop h5 because g4 seems a little bit uh, too much okay he goes to e6 which I think is an inferior move just because it gives me so many opportunities like either uh, any knight jump seems very interesting or as well something like knight e2 opening up bishop's path uh, followed by uh, knight d4 so it's very uh, possible that the uh, game goes knight e2 he plays knight d7 defending and then I have knight d4 he plays rook a defending the bishop but then I have knight g5 and it's such a hilarious position because he can no longer defend the e6 bishop let's have a look uh, he should have kept bishop h5 probably I was still considering g4 and then uh, maybe then uh, take knight e2 something along those lines but look at this first things first double attack he's gonna play like rook e8 and after knight g5 okay he still has um, knight c5 which is the move that uh, I was missing however our position is looking better and better and probably I think I can even start taking advantage of that because knight c5 there seems to be knight e6 bishop f6 and then the h7 pawn uh, will no longer have a defender so this is kind of what uh, I was talking about the bishops uh, have quite nice potential of course uh, it is really uh, nothing special against precise play like in any opening but this was kind of an interesting idea to play for uh, way more interesting than having the restricted bishop on b3 I felt like so just taking and then this pretty much a simple move uh, I can keep the extra piece so he's forced to recap he was forced to recap technically because <laughs> now I can just keep the extra piece but um yeah, if he was, then I just had a free pawn. So, position completely winning. My queen would have came in. That is just crashing. So, uh, we're playing this position. I don't even have to retreat. I can bring my queen. Because uh, Russians never retreat. Okay, that's what Bobby Fischer said, I think. Or I might be wrong on that. Uh, anyways, point is... I may even uh, benefit from a move like bishop takes. But okay, see, we forced him into playing bishop f4. What is bishop f4 doing? It is forcing uh, exchanges. Well, you already know if you've been following the channel for a bit that uh, exchanging pieces while having extra material is exactly the recipe that we're going for. So uh, I'm just going to trade. No more uh, fancy tricks. I'm just going to trade. And then you pause the video. And uh, you find a nice way to exchange queens by force, pretty much. Because once you trade queens while having an extra piece, this is pretty much going to be similar to uh, immediately forcing resignation. In a way that he's not going to have any counterplay uh, after. The only way he could get anything is by keeping queens on the board and somehow getting some weird counterplay against our king. But he has to take just because uh, I'm threatening to check and then uh, mate. Notice how the rook is creating a mating cage for our opponent's king and uh, getting this position. Extra bishop, last step would be to exchange rooks. But yeah, for now I'll just try keeping space and making room for my king uh, to the center. If g6, I'm just gonna go back with the bishop and uh, Slowly but surely, uh, we should definitely make a bit of progress. We just need to kind of push pawns and open up lines so our rook can infiltrate and slowly force a trade. So um, I'll try to expand on this side. Uh, it seems a bit easier since he's already pushing there. And yeah, in case of g6, just going with the bishop back. Uh, yeah. Now perhaps take and that pawn could become a weakness because it's isolated. Um, okay, he's attacking my bishop. I could uh, think of this for a second, but no need to sacrifice uh, in such technical positions if you don't have to. Okay, you're just uh, winning uh, with slow play and uh, threatening this pawn in case of h5, f5 is a nice way to break. And now we got a choice. So we could do symmetrical play or 
I think this one is even more interesting because it's opening up a path to uh, attack F7 right away. So I want to get my uh, pieces like this and he's pretty much uh, not going to have a way to defend. Just watch this. So I'm going to sacrifice for one pawn. But what pretty much I'm doing because uh, there is no way to uh, uh, win, obviously. Here I can have a simple tactic, but I want to show you the procedure. Pretty much we just uh, give away the bishop, but we keep uh, an extra pawn. And in any single king and pawn endgame, just having an extra pawn is going to be giving you a winning game. Uh, okay, maybe we need to make sure uh, his pawns are not going anywhere. So I think I could do a move like c4, b5 takes, a4, d3. Yeah, that's easy. I'm just going to play c4 to make sure his pawns are frozen first. I'm probably not having to play such move, but um, yeah, I just wanted to. And yeah, plays b5. I don't think he's threatening anything, so my goal now is just to um, create a pass pawn. And then I'm going to sacrifice this pawn uh, uh, and uh, I'll try to win uh, these pawns by bringing the king over. Um, this is pretty much one of the most basic and important endgames technique that literally any beginner should get more familiar with, okay? I want you to forget about uh, all those kind of like uh, fancy checkmating ideas that uh, you saw Mihail Tal uh, playing uh, in like uh, the <laughs> 80s, you know? That's nice. You can get games like that occasionally. But I don't want you to get the feeling that uh, this is how most games go in chess. Most games will actually go like this. Okay, now, uh, this is kind of shocking in a way, uh, if you think about it. Is it this simple? Yes. And you don't want to give con play, so I could take... But I think that perhaps gives him b4 idea. And I have to play c4. Okay, I'm going to show this on the board. Because on b4, if I take, then there is... Uh, uh, okay, you should have tried this, by the way. Uh, there is c4 and his pawn could have escaped, you know? Just getting a touchdown like uh, in uh, football. Or you guys say in rugby. But yeah, after he takes, there's no way to create a passer. And I just have a very easy way to implement the strategy that I was just referring to. Because uh, pretty much we'll have to take. I'm going to keep his king under pressure. Then I'm going to slowly uh, bring it like this. Okay, look, so I'm going to give my pawn pretty much as a bait. He has to go back. If Yeah, he has to go back there, and now uh, I can just turn. Okay, like promoting doesn't work because it's going to be a stalemate. Like notice king f6, uh, that's typical way beginners mess this up. So you're not going to win with the pawn, but got uh, these two bad boys on the queen side. So uh, yeah, just going to completely give away on that. And uh, how I usually like to refer to this is like, let's say you have a dog and you throw him the ball. And you're like, uh, oh, come on, dog, go and bring back the ball. We are not going to get any food today. So that's kind of what we're doing to our opponent right now. And uh, he is uh, being a good boy for now. And uh, yeah, until he does anything, we're in time to win all the pawns. And uh, okay, I mean, already... One extra pawn is usually enough, with two, it's like not even a question, so uh, yeah. However, I want to show you this technique of, uh, let's say if you only had one pawn, so let's say this pawn is just not on the board, okay? If you play c4, it's a draw, because you can just stay in front, but if you do this, getting the opposition, it's a very nice uh, typical shouldering, and now you get to make progress. So notice that I'm not even going to use the a pawn in order to uh, do this mechanism. So, uh, yeah, uh, I could do even king d6 here, because king b6 I can push. And uh, if king c8, yeah, look how nicely I'm able to shoulder him. And now I just push. And whenever you reach this position, uh, with king uh, on the sixth and pawn on the fifth, no matter whose turn is to play, that's a book win. That is pretty much the most important uh, king and pawn end game that um, you should know. And, uh, yeah, I'm just going to push and uh, I'm going to take control of the uh, promoting square, run down the pawn, and uh, should just be a very 
convenient promotion because we got the pawn walking on the red carpet, like a little, uh, you know, doing a little Hollywood appearance. Uh, okay, just make sure uh, not to steal me, Alex. Come on, you've got this. Okay. All right, we're getting close uh, to the zone. It's getting uh, pretty warm and cozy. Can you guys feel it? Okay, never mind. Uh, because my opponent resigns. So, before I let you go, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for making it uh, really this far into the video. It's just amazing support. It means the world to me. And I'm glad that I can show you a chess line or two. Or perhaps some stupid jokes that make you laugh. That's it.